Jackson County recently held a workshop on the integration of non-lethal predation tools and methods into county wolf management strategies. For those of you who couldn't make it, here's an overview or watch the entire workshop at jacksoncounty.org. The purpose of, of this workshop, it's, it's an educational workshop and that's what and we're focused on what the, the, the role of non-lethal methods in predation management with a focus on wolves. Now I know as soon as I mention wolves, you know that there's a lot of opinions, a lot of strong feelings either way about wolves and, and, and I, I just want to direct people to say that um, we're not here to discuss whether wolves belong on the landscape. This is, this is a workshop on dealing with the realities of wolves on the landscape because that decision of whether wolves are going to be on landscape, that's already been, that's already been made by the state of Oregon and it's, all, it's, it's already played out and continues to play out as far as how they should be managed and what have you. But non-lethal is, is certainly a, a, a component of the state's plan to manage wolves and that's what we're going to focus on today. So my talk is going to sort of gear up or, or scale up, if you will, from taking these individual tools and applying them kind of at a system level. Because uh, I've been at this 15, 16 years, what I've found is that you know we can we can work on developing a tool like Fladry, um, but it's it's different than actually getting it out on the landscape um, and having it be effective tool for. Um, for whoever it is and um, and there's a lot more to it than just developing that tool and so I want to discuss that and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to build on a, a, a few different systems and they may not necessarily involve livestock I'll try to keep bringing it back to the livestock because I know that's the primary issue we're talking about today but there's some basic principles I think that apply to uh, a lot of different systems and um, and I think the take-home message is, is really something that, that Julie said, which is everybody in this room, whether you're with NRDC, whether you're with the county commission, whether you're a livestock producer, whether you're with Humane Society, or whether you're with Wildlife Services, Fish and Wildlife Service, we all have a stake here um, in this, in this, in what we're talking about. And that it takes that kind of group effort and that group level thinking to really, in my mind, make uh, strides towards better coexistence. And so I'm not here to promote wolves and I'm not here uh, necessarily to promote livestock. What I'm here is, is to say, is to find ways that we can keep both on the landscape and minimize the conflict. So I will say that the commonality to all this is, is the livestock producer. That's who we need to think about in this, in this case because when we're talking about wolves and predators on the landscape, they're the ones that affect it. And folks from the sort of the animal rights groups and the environmental groups um, need to recognize that that's an important stakeholder, affected stakeholder that is critical to this. So um, figuring out ways where we can minimize the conflict is really important, whether you're interested in wolf conservation or not. So just a quick plan. Um, I want to I want to kind of go into what I I think is 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 why we're here today, why we've got this diverse group, and and how societal pressures influence um, uh, livestock producers. And then um, what are the constraints that I get a lot of questions? Why don't you know? Why don't we just kill these predators? And there are some laws that are preventing that. There are societal pressures that are preventing that. And that's why we're focusing more on non-lethal methods than we, than we have in the past. Um, and so I, I look at it as how do we uh, manage predators in the 21st century? And it, to me, it's a balance of lethal and, and non-lethal methods. Um, there's some the principles, important principles of prevention is key for non-lethal methods. Once we get to a, a, a point where we have problem individuals, we really move into um, a cost effectiveness and that we should probably just consider lethal removal. 
Um, and I'm going to build on a few case studies, um, a lot that I've been, been involved with, but some I haven't been involved with, specifically the Blackfoot Challenge um, that I know Zach's going to talk a little bit more about. But again, I'm going to talk a little bit about urban coyotes and urban black bears. These are all systems I've worked in. And, um, and again, I think there's some commonalities, so bear with me when you're, you're, you're asking why is he talking about urban coyotes. Um, there's a point behind that, that that does apply to sort of livestock and, uh, uh, and, and wolves here in Oregon. So whether we look at wolf conflict, urban conflict in, in, in Denver with, uh, with coyotes, or bear conflict in agricultural and urban situations, it's all on the rise, right? And um, in the past, the way we handled this primarily was just taking the predators off the landscape. And, um, um, and societal pressures have changed. And society has said, no, we want the predators on the landscape. And so we're seeing that in urban environments. We're seeing it in rural environments. And, um, and there's, these are new emerging challenges for all of us. And uh, the question is, well, how do we do a better job of, of reducing the conflict? The way I see it is, you know, we, we've got these rural landscapes, the producers, that are, are being very much influenced by uh, uh, an urban society. 80% of our society now lives in urban areas. Um, a lot of the urban folks I interact with, I would say, are uh, naive about what folks on the ground deal with when you're talking about predators. And, um, and I know the producers and folks in wildlife services would, would agree with that. Um, but what do we do about that? Well, that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now is what can we do about that? And there's a big emphasis on, well, let's do non-lethal management. Well, how does, how does all that work within a kind of a bigger system? Um, and what comes out of this dynamic? Well, one of the things that's really come out of this dynamic is the, the laws that impact how we manage predators. You know, starting in the 70s, you know, we had some, some major laws that, uh, that, that limit what we can do. We can no longer just uh, put poison out on the landscape to take care of problems. Um, uh, so the National Environmental Policy Act, and uh, what, how has that affected us? Well, it, it's really limited our, our uh, uh, use of predicides and uh, other pesticides. Um, it, it, creates challenges like uh, a program of aerial gunning. Um, there's, there's pressures on uh, our agency to, to take a look at that. What are the impacts of that? We have to know about, more about what are our impacts on the landscape when we perform management actions. So all these things affect how, um, how we can do things on the landscape. Um, and so the way I see it, is we're kind of in a sort of a, a balancing game here, you know, and it's, it's uh, I, the way I view my job is I have to drink uh, coffee with cowboys and I have to drink uh, latte with greenies. And so what does that mean? So folks, when I go drink co coffee with the cowboys, is what they want is they want fewer predators on the landscape. Um, they want me developing effective tools, often what I hear is, why don't you guys kill more predators? Um, but often I'm hearing more and more is, we just want something that works. And there's a lot of folks that uh, don't care whether it's a lethal or non-lethal tool, they just want something that works. And, um, and, and to me, the way to, to do that is, is, to, is to understand, have a better understanding of what our predator impacts to the livestock industry, how effective are our tools in, in minimizing that. So folks on the other side, um, they're really after more predators on the landscape. Um, and they want non-lethal tools developed. And that's, you hear that over and over again. Um, and they want better understanding of what our impacts are on the predator population. So that's where um, my agency is squeezed. That's where we operate is between these two, um, these two kind of pressures. And, um, and, and so when we talk about options for predator management, 
And I know the emphasis is on non-lethal tools, and that's where most of my work has been has occurred. Um, but what I've learned is, it, you know, we just can't focus on non-lethals with the exclusion of lethal uh, tools, and vice versa. We can't just talk about lethal tools with the exclusion of uh, non-lethal tools. Um, what we typically do in the way wildlife services works, and obviously, or arguably a lot of agencies work, is that we, we kind of have uh, this sort of reactive mindset. So we wait till a producer calls, and we go out and we work on the problem. And, um, and, and a lot of times we're doing that for both lethal and non-lethal sort of solutions. So you, you get a call, like, I've got a wolf in my, in my cows, and uh, you know what, what can we do about it? Well, for, for lethal control actions, having this sort of reactive mindset is probably OK. It's probably a, a valid way to utilize lethal tools. Um, for, from a non-lethal perspective, you know, if, if, we're, if we're reacting to situations, we're, we're too late to the dance. We got to be preventative. So that's one of the things I want you to think about um, and take home is the importance of preventative uh, work with these non-lethal tools. They're not going to be nearly as effective if we're waiting to, for a problem to, to ha have occurred and then try to go out and use these non-lethal tools. So um, from that perspective, um, and Julie, Julie touched on this, so I'm not going to, 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 to dwell into any particular tool. But um, again, when we're acting in a preventative way, we're trying to prevent and change predator biology or predator behavior, and we're trying to anticipate problems. And so that's a real important uh, component to non-lethal to use of non-lethal tools. And again, Julie covered a lot of different tools in our toolbox. I'm not going to dwell on this as, as, as well. Um, what I do want to talk about is, um, is the importance of, of you in this, in this equation. We often talk about the tool effect, uh, efficacy. So that's, you know, and Julie, Julie has talked about how we as scientists look at this you know, we want to measure, OK, well, you get 30 days of effectiveness from Fladry, but you get 60 days with Turbo Fladry. Um, you got to know about, well, Fladry works better with uh, wolves than it does with, with bears or coyotes, you know. So we talk a little bit about carnivore ecology, and we talk about the behavior and things like that. Then we go into the cost effectiveness. All these are important aspects of, of how non-lethal tools um, can be used on the landscape or whether they're used on the landscape. But the thing that, that um, I think is, is critical is, is the attitudes and beliefs and perceptions that go into these tools. And what, do, what does that mean? Um, am I getting wishy-washy here? Well, what the point I'm trying to make is these tools are going to be as effective as you make them. And so if you put them up, and you, you, you put up a light device and just leave it out on the landscape, it's not going to be effective for very long. If you take that light device um, and you use it for a set period and then you move it around, as this gentleman was, was describing, it's going to be more effective. And, uh, and then, but your neighbor, a light device may not work, so something else may work. And so how you view these tools and how much energy and, and effort you put into them is, is really critical. And a lot of that plays back to, to your perceptions and beliefs and how, how you view uh, the, the world and how you view predator management, things like that. So um, what also plays an important role in this is can we find common ground? Can we, uh, can we bring in folks like Zach that can um, have energy in different ways that can help provide resources or knowledge or effort to implement these non-lethal non tools in uh, probably smarter ways. So um, that's what I'm getting at with this. A lot of it is, is riding on how we 
uh, view these tools. So just as a, an example of this, um, and the, the lady in the back is probably going to be disappointed again because we're talking about sheep, but uh, <laughs> um, I did work on this project in Idaho, um, and, and it, it was a, a project conceived by uh, Wildlife Services, uh, a, a gentleman by the name Rick Williamson, who was a specialist for the agency, and he was instrumental in developing a lot of non-lethal tools and having me come out and test them. And, 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 um, and he, he quickly realized that there's no single tool that is going to help in all situations. So what he conceived of was getting Forest Service involved, getting um, producers involved, getting researchers involved, and getting nonprofits like Defenders involved. And so it ended up being this uh, project, which was called the, the Wood River Project in, in Idaho. And um, um, it, evolved, it evolved into having four producers um, uh, working with Defenders of Wildlife, of all people, or of all groups, and <clears throat> in, in utilizing uh, sh shepherding, so real ancient kind of uh, way to deal with predators, but incorporating uh, some non-lethal tools. And it wasn't any single tool that was the focus. It was everything's in the, in the toolbox, as Julie mentioned, and it was pulling out the right tool at the right time. And so um, part, of, part of that effort was educating the folks on the ground, like, what is the right tool? So we have herders from Peru that, that aren't familiar with flattery. They don't understand when to put, put it up and take it down and things like that. So that was a big component of it, was the education. And, um, and defenders played a big, big role in that. They, had, they, played a, they provided resources and uh, effort to help kind of get past some of the learning curves associated with non-lethal tools. And this is kind of what it looked like. This is Blaine County in, in Idaho. And um, so the, some of the gray areas um, were areas where what we were called the protected zone. And this is where, as the sheep bands rolled through these different allotments, um, the, the, the folks working for defenders would, would kind of shadow these, these uh, sheep herds and, and work them through these protected areas, what they call the protected areas. Is, so uh, the sheep bands would go into the protected area. They would go out and uh, use other areas of the forest um, and then maybe come back through. Um, and so we were able to say, all right, well, while they were in the protected area, and while they were in that area, they were, again, they were um, uh, having help from defenders and utilizing flattery, um, scare devices, uh, better monitoring of wolves, just a whole host of tools to um, see if we could reduce predation impacts on the sheep. And this is just some of the landscape they worked in. And uh, again, it was a combination of uh, having people with knowledge of these tools, working with herders, um, doing things like putting up flattery at night, having night pinning situations, um, helping understand where wolves were present, where they wouldn't, where they weren't. And, and this is kind of what we, we found from this uh, study, which was that red line uh, going up is, is, um, is the trend in, in sheep killed by wolves in, the, in an unprotected area that we compare to the protected area. So not surprisingly, you put this kind of effort into protecting sheep, and you're, gonna, you're going to, um, to reduce uh, predation on sheep. And that's not a surprising result, really, right? I mean, so probably what you, everybody's here sitting thinking about is like, well, gosh, I can't afford that. It sounds like a tremendous amount of effort. And you're right. It is a lot more effort. It is a lot more uh, uh, it, um, time things like this. What I'm saying is that maybe there's ways we can uh, combine resources, get help in other ways that are unexpected um, from different groups to help uh, cost share some of this effort. The other thing that did happen was that producers got to the point where their knowledge became more important than, than having people on the ground helping them. And so there was a a learning curve to the use of these non-lethal tools that 
to the point now where this program is self 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 operating. So the producers have taken it over, um, and they are doing they're carrying out this this project on their own. They go after additional funding to help, so that problem doesn't go away. But um, the the education and the knowledge and things like that are now in their hands, and they're they're figuring things out and 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 understanding the system better than than anybody that like myself or defenders that, that kind of helped start this project. So the, the other thing I want to kind of put in your head is, is the concept of problem individuals. And, um, and this is just a, simply an idea that some individuals cause more trouble than others. And, and, it's, uh, and I think it's a critical component when you're thinking at a system level. Uh, because to me, it dictates whether we're talking about lethal or non-lethal tools. And I think ultimately, um, you know, when we're talking about in Oregon and dealing with, with wolves, a new kind of predator on the landscape, it's hard to talk about lethal control because you have a very small population. It's growing. Fish and Wildlife Service, Oregon has goals to get that population to a certain level. At some point, you're going to hit that level and there's going to be less concern about removing individuals from that population. And, um, and at that point, um, it, it becomes, there's, there's less uh, emphasis on non-lethal tools when you're dealing with a problem individual. So an individual that gets into some cattle and is causing problems, there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that once they pass a threshold and start killing cattle, um, that it's easier for them to continue that. And at some point, it's just easier, more effective, and probably the right thing to do to remove those individuals from the population. So examples of that, uh, I studied bears in Yosemite National Park. And uh, when I started studying that, those, those bears, one of the big issues they were having was uh, bears breaking into cars. We're talking thousands of cars per year causing hundreds of thousands of dollars in insurance claims. And what we found was they were actually selecting certain vehicles uh, to, to target. It was minivans. And, um, and so why minivans? Well, anybody with kid in a minivan understands the mess that is created in a minivan, right? Um, and so bears were picking up on that. So here we're talking, you know, we're talking about behavior of these animals, but the other really, interesting part of this story is that there was probably about half a dozen bears that were causing this problem. So you can imagine Yosemite being in close proximity to, to San Francisco. The idea when, to, of lethally removing a bear became front page news often in the newspapers. So the managers were faced with this societal pressure and it was, it, it was intense. Uh, you know, if they would say, we want to remove a, a bear, um, you know, they would get all kinds of pressure. But it was, became very obvious that it was a few individuals. And so over time, over a few years, they got, I don't know if braver is the right word, but uh, they got to the point where they were removed, they removed most of the problem individuals. And um, in conjunction with that, they got very... Uh, adamant about prevention. So everybody that came in uh, with a car, there was a tremendous education outreach. Uh, there was uh, all kinds of enforcement that went into reducing the trash in cars. Um, and today, that, that problem that they were experiencing 10 years ago is, is much reduced. It's not gone. It's much reduced, though. The point is, once the once the animal has learned this kind of behavior, it's really hard to stop with non-lethal tools. And they tried cat and mouse games constantly throughout the night. Uh, so again, this system isn't wolves and livestock, but the same principles, I think, apply. We can go to another system where we're talking about urban coyotes. And um, it's the same kind of story um, in Denver, um, Coyotes have been in, in that system for 20, 30 years, literally in, kind of in downtown Denver. You can find coyotes just like you, similar to all the cities in, 
in, in North America. Coyotes have moved into our cities. And, but it wasn't until about 2005 when we started seeing behavior, this, this picture over on the, on the right, that little, this right here is a person's head and he's running down a trail and we've got a coyote following him. And, um, and so we were seeing more and more of this kind of very bold behavior emerge. Um, we were having incidents where children were being attacked in 2009 and got to the point where this gentleman was, was attacked by a pack of coyotes in 2013. And, um, and so we see this emergence of um, uh, real kind of extreme, what I'd call extreme behavior from these carnivores. Well, this was probably a learned behavior that occurred over time and, and got to the point where we developed some individuals within the population that were real problems. And I'm not saying all the coyotes were like that. They weren't. It was just a few individuals. And so um, one of the, one of the di part of that dynamic that as I entered this system, there were a couple uh, animal rights groups that were adamant that it, you, to manage this, you only could use non-lethal tools. And so we tried. And um, we went through a lot of uh, use of education and things like that to get to a, a point where we could manage some of these problem individuals. The short of it, and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail here in a little bit, but it, it didn't work. Um, and that the lethal removal of these problem individuals was really important por uh, component of taming down some of this conflict. I love it. Yes, sir. I, I talk a lot, sorry. But it's uh, all right. No, little, that's great. A little personal experience there on that Milmar ranch that we moved on to a year ago, April. May I, may I ask yeah. you to? Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go. <laughs> a personal experience we had up there on that Milmar ranch that we moved on to April essentially home for OR7 up there. We saw OR25 at between 35 and 40 yards uh, earlier this, I think it was earlier this spring, and uh, right off our driveway in the open. He had his head down, quartered to us, sniffing a big stump on a 100-horse tractor. She was with me. My older son was with me. Stopped the tractor, didn't turn it off, just throttled it back. He picked his head up, didn't acknowledge us, didn't look at us, ambled, I mean almost in slow motion about eight more yards, sniffed another stump, and I yipped at it like a coyote, didn't twitch an ear, didn't look over his shoulder, didn't change body posture, just slow motion on up the hill. My older boy yells at it, get out of here. Still absolutely no reaction. And this was in, this was probably 120 yards from her house, like I said, out in the open, right off her driveway, and John knows exactly where that was. And, uh, I mean, to me, that's kind of bizarre behavior for a big, big uh, wolf like that. Had no fear. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I'd characterize it as bizarre behavior. It's, um, what it, it, it's definitely behavior I've seen over and over again in different carnivore species if you give them that tolerance to exist. And the great challenge, and John can probably weigh in here because he may disagree with what, I, what I'm going to say here, but you know, I, I'd argue that individual should be removed from the population because there's, there's just too much, uh, uh, too much risk, right? And, the, but the big, the big challenge John's facing and, and folks from from Oregon they're trying to recover this population is well some at that at that level when you have a small population every individual counts and so it's it's a dilemma and um, the hope is that you get to a point where there's less of that kind of dilemma and that there's less tolerance for that kind of individual you remove it and it's not impacting the population it's no big deal um, but until you get there you know those non-lethal tools are the only thing you have, so uh, how, you, how you handle that is, is hard. It's part of the hard part of, of recovery. So. And so the um, point I'm making here is behavior is a real important component to this whole story, as, as we've heard, and, 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 um, and how, we, uh, 
how we look at behavior is, is an important thing to think about um, when we're talking about managing this conflict. And um, some, of the, some of the concepts I, I want to leave you with is that um, and, and one, one of the things we've done is, is we've compared uh, behavior of coyotes in a couple different systems. One is this, the U represents a, an urban system. So this is from coyote behavior in Denver. And we're looking at how bold individuals are. So we have a mechanism to sort of measure that behavior. And versus a rural system. Well, what's the difference between a rural and an urban system? So in Denver, coyotes are not trapped. They're not hunted. They're not persecuted in any way. In a rural system, that's pretty much the exact opposite. I'm not promoting the idea of hunting and, and trapping and uh, persecution of, of uh Coyotes, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm just comparing these two different systems and trying to make the point that, one, um, you see a lot of variation in individual behavior. So it's not all individuals that become very bold. Um, it's only a, you know, a, a few individuals. Um, but if you, without that pressure, this is something that, that you're going to see sort of come out of, out of a population as you get more and more problem individuals. So. Um, it, it probably does um, relate to, to the, the notion that lethal control can be important not only for uh, at a population level, but at a behavioral level as well. So how do these problem individuals develop? And um, I was speaking with this gentleman. What's your, what's your name, sir? Yeah. Ted. Ted about... Uh, uh, predator search image, or maybe it wasn't Ted, maybe it was another person, anyway, um, and how, uh, you know, how, why is it that some wolves only kill cattle, or only kill native prey, don't, and they'll walk through a herd of cattle and they won't, they won't necessarily kill them, or even chase them, and there's multiple accounts of that, I hear it from all the time from people, it's like, well, that, that wolf pack's a really good pack of wolves, don't mess with that pack of wolves because they don't mess with my cattle. And there's something to it, and I don't have any good sort of scientific uh, data to show you, but uh, I've heard it enough times to believe that that's true, um, and that there's, you know, they, that they develop some, uh, a search image for certain types of prey, and you want that search image to be developed around native prey. So um, uh, there's probably genetics that go into that. There's probably also ecological kind of aspects of learning, and we don't know a whole lot about that. It's, a, it's an important area that, that, that I'm interested in, but um, there's no doubt that an individual will do experimenting as it goes through life about what to eat. And, um, and so you can imagine if you have a landscape like this, where you've got elk and cattle spread through the landscape kind of homogeneously, that a wolf going through that landscape is going to have multiple opportunities to interact with, with livestock. And I contend, not that I have a lot of data to support this, it's this kind of dynamic that's really important for uh, developing individuals that learn to kill livestock. So in this kind of situation, if you have a population of wolves, I would argue that, that uh, just nearly any, any wolf is, has the potential to be a problem individual. Is because they're exposed to cattle all the time, it becomes almost part of their, uh, their native prey. So what can, we, what can we do? Well, we can, we can lump cattle or other uh, livestock. What does that do? Well, it reduces the interaction between your carnivores and your livestock. It also provides the opportunity to make non-lethal tools like flattery, um, other things, more effective. Um, and so, what am I saying? <laughs> I don't want to tell people how to manage their livestock. I know that that uh, is a very contentious thing to say. Um, but that's, in a sense, what I'm suggesting uh, is that is an important component of these non-lethal tools, is how you manage how your livestock is, plays a big role in this dynamic. And, um, um, and so, you know, we. What we're after is that a, a wolf that travels is traveling through the landscape doesn't have an opportunity to interact with the cattle, doesn't have an opportunity to learn 
um, that cattle are, are, are part of its diet. Um, we get to that point, we can, you know, again, these tools are, are more effective in a preventative way. So uh, uh, this is, I'm going to dive back into the urban conflict uh, with coyotes. And just to emphasize some of those points, again, we had just kind of very odd behavior emerging, showing this very bold sort of behavior from individual coyotes. And, um, and so that really formed the basis of this kind of comprehensive system-wide study. And this is where I think, um, um, you know, Julie and I, uh, where we should focus more energy is let's develop tools, but let's test them out in these systems Let's learn about the humans, learn about the, the animals together, because it's that dynamic where we, we learn more about when it's effective to put these tools out on the landscape when it's not. And so that became a big part of, of the effort was understanding um, when to use non-lethal tools and understanding when lethal was, uh, tools were appropriate. And one of the big tools identified as um, or emphasized in these in this urban situation was we need to educate people. We need to educate them how to haze coyotes, how to uh, deter coyotes, how to be more aggressive towards coyotes. Um, the urban population, as we kind of, kind of know, is, is a lot of times we're afraid of coyotes. They would tolerate coyotes in, in ways that many of us in this room would never think of tolerating coyotes. And, um, not necessarily saying that's bad, but what it's done is it's allowed, again, certain individuals to develop this bold behavior. So one of the, one of the things you'll hear over and over again with this urban coyote problem is, ah, you know, we need to haze coyotes more, and we need to get the public engaged in doing that. So I worked with one of the best education specialists in Denver, if not, you know, in the country, an amazing person that was adamantly... Um, uh, well, not adamantly, but it was opposed to lethal control initially and was believed that education was the key. Um, you hear that from other groups, that we, if we just haze these coyotes, teach them that we can, we can deal with this problem. And so we, we did that, and, and we worked a lot with problem coyotes. And the take-home from it is that uh, we didn't find any real effectiveness of hazing for changing the behavior of these coyotes. And, um, and we, we, we tried hard. We developed uh, this big public outreach. Um, we had a QR code on all these signs where we, you put it up, you put your phone up to this QR code and it would bring you to a, a link on uh, a video we made on how to haze coyotes. Um, and we pulled off this big hazing study. And the, the take home from it was that we really didn't see much effect of it for dealing with problem individual coyotes. And, um, and so uh, uh, what I also wanted to do was, was look at, well, what does it mean to lethally remove coyotes in, in urban areas, and how, how many coyotes are removed, and what does that do for, uh, for conflict? And so what we did was we mapped from 2009 to 2014 every coyote that was removed in Denver and that's what these circles represent on the map with the little dot in, in the middle, is that's a coyote that was taken out. Um, the circle represents the average home range size. And so what we wanted to say was, well, one, how many coyotes are being removed? It was about one to 2% of the population per year. Um, so from a population standpoint, zero effect on coyotes. But that's not something you'll hear from certain groups. Some groups will say, you can't remove any because either one, you're impacting the population, or two, you're encouraging um, more coyotes to be on the landscape, both of which are false. Um, uh, and, and the reality was the agencies were removing a very small percentage, four or five coyotes on average per year. Um, what does that do for a recurrence of conflict? And I think that's maybe something we should talk about is, uh, as a, as a way to standardize our measurements of, of conflict. How often do these problems recur? And what we found was, in some, in some cases, um, you know, you remove that conflict, you don't have conflict for three, four years. We stopped measuring it after, after three years. Um, 
But in other situations, and there's a example right here. That's actually three points um, where it, it just kept recurring and recurring. Um, and part of the problem with lethal removal is getting the right problem individual. And arguably, all the, all the three of those points occurred within a few months. And so uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that lethal removal is effective if you get the right individual. Um, and being able to target the right individual is, is not easy. Um, in some cases. Um, and that's where having specialists that are good at that is, is valuable. So um, I get this a lot. What would I do um, if I was in your shoes uh, as a producer? Well, understand what is driving the conflict. And, that, and so it's not just that wolves are killing cattle. Understand the dynamics of that. Uh, when does it occur? Um, how often does it occur? Think about are there things that I can, how, how am I affecting the system? How do I limit the development of problem individuals? And what can I do as a preventive non lethal measures? So, um, certainly, r removing problem individuals is something I'm promoting, uh, but I'm also promoting how do we prevent that from happening? So this is right, really easy, right? So uh, um, that's why we're here. And, and again, I want to emphasize, if we can come together, find the common ground, then that's, I think, the best hope. And I, I believe Zach is going to speak a little bit more about this Blackfoot challenge. But I want to touch briefly on it, because to me, it's, um, it's an it's a interesting model to think about for possibly for somewhere in Oregon. Um, and so this is a pretty large watershed, Blackfoot watershed in Montana. And it's a very complex watershed. And complex, I mean, there's all kinds of different ownership from Forest Service to BLM land to Nature Conservancy to private land to, um, to other, other types of ownership. Um, there's a lot of different agencies involved in this, from Fish and Wildlife Service to to, um, to, to state, to forest service, to wildlife services. And, and so the, the people that are operating in this, um, running livestock, um, they talk about issues beyond predators. You know, this group was formed to talk about issues associated with water. And, but they've moved into endangered species and they moved into to predators, and they've all come together as a group. So it's, it's the ranchers working with these different government agencies, working with the NGOs, um, working with uh, um, the, the managers from, from the state game agencies. And, and there's regular interaction. There's not always consensus. There's argument. But there's um, a, a way to move forward as a group, and I don't I don't want to speak to how that works because I don't know how that works. But um, it does work. If we're looking at predator, uh, predator issues, what you see here in that yellow sort of green line is the number of known wolves in that watershed. And you can see that growing in 2007 and kind of stabilizing in about 2011. And this is, uh, and then the red line is the number of uh, Wolves that are lethally removed per each year, uh, generally below 10, and a lot of times below 5, or sometimes uh, no wolves removed. And then, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a blue line behind that red line that's the, the number of livestock killed uh, per year. So it's a very low number. Um, it's a low number of wolves removed, and it's a stable wolf population. To me, this is what you guys are after. Um, the, the, what goes into this dynamic is a whole lot of preventative work. So um, some of the keys, I think, that have been identified in the system are removing live, dead livestock and range riders. Is, uh, and maybe Zach can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong there. But those are, those are two of the, the kind of the tools that have been identified as um, really critical. 
And it's, I would kind of put my two cents into that, which is to say that it's that cooperative effort, it's that working together, it's that knowledge um, shared amongst neighbors, and, um, and it's that presence on the landscape that all help sort of uh, uh, reduce the conflict, maintain wolves on the landscape, and maintain, as importantly, or more importantly, maintain the, the producers and their livelihood on that landscape. So what would I do? That's what I'd be shooting for. And uh, um, so that, I think from, that's all I have to say. If, if there are questions, uh, I don't know if we have time, but. Uh, you know, it looks like we have a pretty good idea about coyotes, and they make a pretty good model to ask this question. Are, are the wolves going to learn from coyotes from observation? And if they see coyotes tracking into town and eating cat food on the porch, why wouldn't the wolves do the same thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we would see that. Um, you know, there's, there's big differences in the biology, um, and there's also big differences in the tolerance. Um, and coyotes are going to, they're, they're truly omnivores. They can make a living off of berries, insects, up to, you know, small prey, um, whereas wolves are specialized on larger prey. And so uh, you, I just, I don't, I don't see that happening. But um, as far as them learning from coyotes, um, I, uh, my understanding is that there's, they probably don't learn a lot from coyotes, but they, they can be important competitors with coyotes and, and actually pretty lethal with coyotes. So that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah. And, and, a, and, a, and a next question, we're in a community that the livestock industry is failing here. So there isn't going to be as much livestock out there as there was at one time. Um, the sheep industry is non-existent here now. And so as that group of possibilities for dinner for a wolf goes down, surely they're going to turn and look at at domestic animals, cats and dogs, possibly people, because um, what else are they going to eat? Well, uh, um, I, I guess I would I would view that as sort of an extreme view. We haven't haven't seen that, seen evidence of that. Um, you, you look if you look at Montana. Um, you know, the population has stabilized, the wolf population. And um, why is that? Well, you know, where they have wolves, at some point wolves start being very territorial and, and they start interacting amongst themselves and they'll, they'll kind of keep their population in check. And so the only way you have wolves population growing is them expanding into more area. And, um, and there's a point where there's so many cattle or livestock or human development on the landscape that the tolerance for wolves just is is too low, and and either they're shot or uh, controlled by management, or um, or for or or run over things like that. There there's just too much development to where you know wolves don't make sense on the landscape, and um, and I think that's probably true throughout you know throughout the country is that there are appropriate places for wolves, but not every place is appropriate for wolves. And, um, and what goes into that is primarily how many land livestock are on the ground and, and what, are, what is tolerance for, for those animals. And so th those decisions are driven by a lot by the state, uh, state agencies, like where do we think wolves are appropriate? And I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think Oregon probably has similar kind of boundaries set up. So, but I, I don't, I don't think, uh, um, you know, I don't think worrying about pets is an issue with wolves, um, and certainly worrying about people being eaten by wolves. There's there's no evidence of that, at least uh, in the the lower 48s. And, and I got to tell you this, you guys. I'm asking some of these questions. There's a lot of community that's not present here today sure. that would ask these questions and have Absolutely. asked them. No, um, and so I've listened. You know. Yeah, they're valid questions for sure. Sure. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that I've heard pointed out in the last couple of years 
repeatedly, is that we used to believe the same thing about the coyotes. It wasn't until they were going up and down the sidewalk with the kids that people started going, wow, you know what? That didn't turn out to be true, um, that they were a very different animal than we thought. And, and for win many winters now, I've tracked coyotes from the east side of this valley into the little towns here, and you can walk right behind them, and there's packs of them going into town, and you can see they come back because you're walking in the snow. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you have a valid point. Uh, Julie's studying hyenas in Africa mm -hmm. in a couple cities where the hyenas are, uh, they live in the cities. Um, certainly we have coyotes doing that, and there are examples now where uh, black bears in New Jersey, where they're living in these highly uh, urbanized areas. So could a wolf make a living in an urban area? Yes, it could. Um, and there's, you know, wolves do that in India, um, and they kill... Um, people every year, um, and they live in fairly dense populations of, or very dense populations of people. So they are capable of that, and you probably see a, uh, a wolf evolve into something uh, that could tolerate an urban environment. What I'm saying is that our society doesn't have tolerance for, for wolves in particular to, at this point, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, Maybe in 100 years, something changes. But at this point, what I see is that, you know, you get to a certain threshold, um, there's, there's little tolerance for wolves on the landscape. And that threshold, again, deals with how many livestock are on the ground and, and who's in a rural, you know, people in the rural environment. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Most people would not tolerate wolves in, in the subdivision in Metro Oregon. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure there'd be a lot to be said about that. Right, right. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what we're talking about is, 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 is people that are trying to make a living on, a, on, a, on the landscape um, that are away from these urban centers. You know, that's, I think that's where we need to focus the, the energy is, um, you know, how to minimize the conflict there. You know, where, where the state decides they want wolves or the Fish and Wildlife Service says, yeah, wolves can be here. Mm -hmm. um, it's those people that I think most about is like, well, okay, how do we, how do we match their needs um, and what can we do to, to help? So. And, and, I, and I have to offer up another community that's evolving in Oregon, and that's the small farm community um, where we have, you can go into Portland, you know, and there's people there with a couple acres of vegetables and chickens and what have you. And, and you see variations of that as you move away from urban areas. You'll see maybe five or ten acres. There might be a few cows there. And so for those folks, predators are an intense issue because if, you know, if you have a, a beloved group of five milk cows and one ends up dead or it's calf, that's a big issue. So I'm also thinking of those people because they, they've had some crises. I just fit, I just went to a farm the other day. All the turkeys were killed in one night. A lot yeah. of turkeys by coyotes. Well, and, and back to this to this lady's uh, comment. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I, I think I'm certainly not here to promote fear mongering. Sure. Um, I I think these are remarkable animals, predators, and I enjoy seeing them on the landscape. But I've also seen them. In situations where wolves have, you know, pulled a calf out of a out of a cow, and there's cows left um, with bloody haunches, and the calf's dead, and it's just it's pretty horrific. Um, and so the people that experience that are going to have a different perception than uh, folks in the urban environment that, that don't see that. So I mean, maybe one of the the benefits of having coyotes in an urban landscape is that you know sometimes people will get to see what a predator can do. I'm not saying they do that all the time, but predation can be, uh, can be ugly. And so I don't deny that. Um, and I think the people that experience that have probably have a different perception than, than other folks. And so to deny that that occurs, I, think, I don't think is, is necessarily the right answer either. It's, you know, let, let's deal with this in a, in a way where we maintain a wolf population and we maintain the folks making a living on the ground. Th thanks. Good, good answers. Thanks, Dor.